All right, hello everybody. Um, testing my screen. Okay, cool. Um, all right, thank you all for coming to today's talk, um, both in person and virtually. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Gina Kwan from San Jose State University. Gina got her undergraduate degree in physics here at UC Berkeley in, two, in 2012, go Bears. Uh, she went on to the University of Maryland College Park where she earned her PhD in physics. Uh, her dissertation focused on developing inclusive learning spaces which support community building and reflection and studying identity, identity within these spaces. She was then a research associate at the University of Colorado Boulder in the Center for STEM Learning. Um, Gina is a co-founder of the Access Network, an NSF, an NSF funded research practice community dedicated to fostering community and supporting diversity efforts in undergraduate physical science programs. Um, the Access Network consists of nine university programs, including UC Berkeley's own Compass, Pro Compass Project. Um, this is actually where I met Gina, um, the Compass Project, as well as the Access Network. We have a, a yearly assembly. Um, I met Gina in 2017 at one of these assemblies and have seen her every year since then. Um, Gina is now a, an associate professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at San Jose State University, where her current research focuses on fostering equity authentic physics practices and cultural change within physics departments. Um, Gina has also co-authored a book, Facilitate, Facilitating Change in Higher Education in uh, the Department Action Team Model. This book here. All right, so uh, please help me give a warm welcome to our speaker, Dr. Gina Kwan. Thank you, Donnie, for that lovely introduction. Um, I am really excited to be here uh, I see many of the people who taught me physics in the room right now um, and also on Zoom. Um, and so it is a little bit surreal and just truly amazing to be here. Um, if you would like to follow along with the slides, I have a QR code up here um, and also a tiny URL. Um, all of the papers I'll actually be referring to are hyperlinked um, too. So if you want to read more, um, and I guess if you're following on Zoom, then you're already following along on your own site. And so, uh, all right, just need to click. Okay, so I wanted to start with some personal history because um, I know that um, don't know everyone in the audience today. Um, so I was actually an undergrad physics major, as Donnie mentioned here um, in Berkeley, go Bears. Um, and the Compass Project um, was uh, a formative component of my experience here. Um, and so um, here's actually a picture of Compass in 2008 um, on top of Lick Observatory. I then went on to receive my uh, physics PhD from the University of Maryland College Park Campus um, in 2017 doing physics education research um, and specifically focusing on undergraduate research experiences and thinking about how to make those productive for students. Uh, and also while I was there, um, several other folks who had been a part of Compass um, and I were also off starting our own kind of similar Compass-like programs in other spaces. And so um, I helped start up a site uh, at the University of Maryland, um, which now calls itself Equity Constellation. Um, and in 2015, we actually got an NSF grant to, to form a network um, such that all of these sites could learn and grow together. I then was a postdoc at the University of Colorado Boulder, um, and I worked with fellow Cal, uh, Cal alums, uh, Joel Corbo and Dan Reinholtz, um, specifically studying departmental change. And now I'm realizing the fatal flaw in how I've set up my screen, which is I actually, I cannot see my own slides. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna rearrange everyone on Zoom really quick so I can. Uh, have a place to read the text I wrote. All right, um, so I have been at SJSU now as an assistant professor um, since 2019. Um, and the stuff I'm talking about today is really um, the work of a phenomenal team of folks um, that I'm proud to call colleagues um, separated at, or 
at, at many um, different universities, um, but, but particularly the majority of this work um, takes place uh, at CU Boulder. Um, and the departments I'll be talking about today actually all come from CU Boulder. Um, and also Colorado State is another place where we've been doing this work. And so for today's talk, um, I'm gonna be first starting out with um, some considerations for equity focused change in physics departments um, within universities. Um, I will then talk about the departmental action team model um, as one way to cultivate departmental change. Um, but I don't think this is the only way to cultivate departmental change. Um, so I wanna just zoom out and talk about some of the lessons we've learned um, when we have um, students and faculty working together um, and some of the implications for that. Um, and so where I'm starting from, and I, I think um, it seems like a lot of folks, um, this won't be super new to, because I, I guess all day I've been hearing about the awesome DEI work that's ha been happening at Berkeley, um, but improving equity is a central concern in physics departments. Um, and here in this talk, um, when I say equity, I'm referring to um, the fair distribution of opportunities to learn and participate. Um, and I'm also starting from um, the point that inequities um, or the lack of equity um, stems from um, forms of oppression, um, including racism, sexism, homophobia, um, xenophobia, transphobia, ableism, kind of all of those isms. Um, uh, and additionally, um, there's been plenty of research already that has documented the stagnation and in some cases decline in the recruitment and retention of students from underrepresented groups. Um, and um, additional research has documented um, that this stems from a really complex set of factors um, that affect their experiences. Um, and so um, I guess maybe all of these <laughs> reports that I've cited along the bottom um, are available to you if you, uh, if you wanna learn more. Um, and so I actually wanted to start with um, maybe a discussion question or just a thinking question. Um, so think of an effort to improve diversity, equity, inclusion or justice in physics, or if you're joining from another discipline, another discipline, um, and then reflect on these questions. Some of them you might not be able to answer and that's okay. Um, but first, what is it? Um, uh, what are the goals? How does it work to achieve those goals? Um, what is the problem that this effort is trying to address? Um, and who leads this effort and who makes decisions? Um, so I invite you to think for a little bit and when you feel ready, turn to the person near you um, and share what you're thinking. And if you're on the chat, actually, I invite you to also just type some responses in the chat. I'll read them as they come in. What don't you think? Oh, I'll tell me what to think.
All right, folks, take 10 more seconds to wrap up your last thoughts. I guess if you're still typing, you're welcome to just continue typing um, because you can keep typing things as I'm talking. All right, let's bring it back to the whole class or colloquium. Um, so I heard a lot of really interesting, great ideas. Um, uh, I'm actually curious if anyone in the room wants to share something that they talked about. Yeah, in the back. Hmm. Hmm. Great, thank <laughs> Great, thanks for sharing. And yeah, I definitely didn't ex Oh. Oh, you were right. Um, yeah, so for those who are joining online, um, uh, someone brought up uh, grad student um, participation in faculty recruitment, particular um, lunches um, that I think I actually saw outside earlier today, um, where uh, students have the opportunity to ask about teaching and DEI. Um, yeah, did I summarize your idea? Okay, great. Um, I'm actually gonna move on. Um, so uh, I think I don't need to tell you this, but there's a, there's a wide landscape of efforts um, to improve equity in the physical sciences. Um, and some of the dimensions at which these efforts differ um, are maybe among leadership, like who is leading this? Um, faculty, staff, um, there's also undergrad and grad student loud efforts. Um, uh, there's even like the scale and setting of where these are taking place. So um, there are things that are happening within departments. Um, there's also things that happen maybe at college-wide um, or, or even university-wide um, or, or even like professional societies. Um, and the kind, the, the issue at hand um, can look a little bit different in, in, in each of these efforts. So maybe like changing the culture or addressing something, something that students might be missing. Um, and these are also tied to different types of skills or goals. Um, so like retention, um, skill building, maybe reducing bias, maybe creating some kind of structural change. Um, and today um, I'm gonna be focusing on uh, infusing uh, equity into departmental based changes. So that's kind of where I'm locating myself um, on, on this spectrum. And so some kinds of change are easy. Um, but changing STEM departments is not one of those kinds of changes. Um, and here's actually a, a comic um, slash metaphor that comes from my colleague, Joel Corbo, um, how, how we might sometimes think of change is like pushing a boulder up a hill. So you see this boulder at the bottom of the hill and you're like, this sucks. Um, I want this to be at the top of the hill. So you push it, you say, this is hard work, um, but it'll be worth it. Um, and then it gets to the top and you say, yay, I fixed it, I did the change. Um, but usually change isn't that simple um, because kind of more typically, um, you, maybe you go to sleep that night um, and you, you wake up and the boulder's at the bottom of the hill and you're like, damn it. Um, and then you might say like, okay, so what happened here? Um, and maybe this is where the metaphor becomes, you know, potentially even more strange. Um, but let's say that there are these little garden gnomes that come out every night and their job is to push the boulder back down the hill. And at this point, you're probably wondering, what is she talking about with these garden gnomes? Um, but the gnomes are a metaphor for why the rock was down there in the first place. Um, in departments, these are things like incentive structures, such as your tenure and promotion criteria, or your decision-making structures, such as what kinds of decisions happen in committee versus from the chair, um, and your norms and beliefs um, maybe about what physics is and what it looks like to do physics. And gnomes function in this way to revert things back to the way they were. Um, and so um, I think gnomes are a useful metaphor because even 
people who have the best intention um, can inadvertently maintain the status quo um, because maybe they're upholding these zones, um, which are then pushing the boulder back down the hill. And so what we learned from these gnomes um, is that sustainability of a change is not actually a given. Um, a change tied to a specific person or people um, can decay. Um, like you all probably know of maybe say, if someone reforms a course, um, kind of the next time someone else teaches that course, um, it, it, it'll, it'll likely revert back to how it was. Um, and changes that are at odds with dominant values will face resistance um, because, you know, if it's not really how we do things here, um, it's, it's, it's not likely um, to be maintained. And finally, changes that can't adapt to changing circumstances um, become obsolete. Um, and, and there's a, there's a nice quote from Senge um, who says, kind of, today's problems were yesterday's solutions. Um, and so, I guess I said I would start this talk with some considerations for equity. Um, and I, now I'm going to argue that, that gnomes are something that live in our culture. Um, but maybe first to think about where does the problem of inequity live? Um, and we can think about equity, I guess we're physicists, so we might as well model things. We can think about equity as living within individuals, um, within day-to-day -day interactions between people, um, and within our classroom and departmental culture. Um, and when we're thinking about inequity as living as a problem just within people, we might say things like, oh, these students are lacking confidence. Or we might try to measure their interest and ask why it's changing. Um, we might try to understand their preparation, or maybe we'll look for things like stereotype threat. Um, but, you know, students don't exist in a vacuum. If they did, they wouldn't for very long. Um, <laughs> Um, so we might as well ask, you know, how might some of these phenomena actually come to be? Um, and for that, we need to zoom out to one grain size bigger um, and think about the day-to-day -day interactions. Um, and sort of other research, um, specifically research that focuses on um, kind of classroom learning and interactions um, has documented how harassment, discrimination, exclusion, these are all present in classrooms um, and sort of our the places where we learn. Um, maybe less overt, um, but also very important, are things like microaggressions and minimizations. Um, and even just how people perceive each other to be competent um, can, can be also laid in with bias. So both how students perceive each other as competent and how faculty perceive students to be competent or not. Um, and if we zoom out even just another grain size, we can start to add even more explanation under um, where this is coming from. So um, kind of a different set of research that uh, is more around like social studies of science, kind of like basically people being like sociologists of science, scientists, um, has really worked to understand the culture of, of um, STEM and physics. So um, we see how features of dominant cultures, for example, competitiveness or individualism, or maybe beliefs that science is a meritocracy um, can contribute to marginalization. Um, maybe as an example of this, you know, we've probably all heard of, um, you know, it's the story of you know, Albert Einstein in the patent office, sort of like this lone genius, right? Um, and it can create this, this picture that science is done by individuals. Um, and so it can lead, um, it can lead people who might thrive in sort of a more collaborative setting um, to be pushed out. Um, and also, as we all know, like there's, there's plenty of pl space in science for people who want to collaborate. In fact, that's how a lot of science gets done. Um, and so culture here um, is also, are, are those gnomes um, that, that I introduced this talk with. Um, they are the observable practices and structures, um, like things we can see. For example, like a degree requirement or, a, or a, like a major's roadmap um, or grading scales. Um, and they're also the things that are harder to see but are just as present, um, like norms and beliefs. Um, for example, your assumptions about who is cut out for physics. And even the idea of being cut out for physics um, is, is full of beliefs in and of itself. Um, but it can be really hard to see this culture 
Um, and actually in her book, Beam Times and Lifetimes, which is a study of um, physicists working at particle accelerators, um, Sharon Trawick um, described physics as having this culture of no culture, um, which refers to this belief that physics kind of exists independent of social concerns. Um, and so that can make it really hard um, to see cultural features. Um, and so what are the implications of looking at equity at these different grain sizes? Um, so on the right hand side, I have an image. You don't actually need to worry about what it's saying, it's, but it's probably an image that's similar to, to others we have seen that describes the, the pipeline through STEM, um, where it's looking at students um, sort of leaving STEM at different stages in their life. Um, and so if we blend an individual perspective, and maybe this commonly used pipeline metaphor, um, it can lead us to diagnose a problem as students are leaking from this pipeline. Um, and so we must kind of plug the holes. Um, otherwise, all of these students will drip out. Um, and um, so sort of in plugging these holes, that will often, uh, that, that, that perspective will lead us to take some of these within individual explanations that I had talked about on the previous slide. Like maybe you try to fix their sense of belonging or get them motivated, um, you know, patch up whatever background they're missing. Um, but like any model, um, this also has limitations. Uh, for example, it models students as a uniform fluid that has sort of like a fixed pathway and endpoint. Um, and maybe to first orders, so you could model students as a uniform fluid, but you know, students also have their own kind of unique experiences, desires. Um, and um, additionally, I guess plenty of research has also shown that all of the things, all of the negative aspects of the experience that cause students to be leaving at these points are also hurting the students who stay. Um, and so um, without addressing the broader culture, we will still have problems. Um, we just might not be able to necessarily see them in the, in the numbers we're seeing. Um, and so I argue that we should change the system, not the students. Um, and some of what this might look like um, is first we should recognize that this issue is systemic. Um, and so uh, we should um, create structures for learning more about oppression and how it shows up here. Um, we should also assume that harmful cultural patterns will emerge as we try to do equity focused change work. Um, and so creating structures to listen to and receive critical feedback um, is also important. Um, it's important to also seek out and value um, marginalized voices. Um, so this means cultivating diverse membership, but it also means <laughs> the valuing piece also means you know, avoiding tokenizing or essentializing these voices. Um, and one of the things I'll be talking about um, in the last chunk of this talk is, is, is what it looks like to move from designing for to designing with students. Um, and so um, thinking about what it looks like to really center um, student leadership and expertise and agency. Um, and so the departmental action team model um, uh, is, is one that we've worked on, um, which are teams of faculty, students, and staff that are all in a single department. Um, and we also have external facilitators who are people outside of a department um, whose role it is to facilitate. Um, and they're working on some central issue in undergraduate education. Uh, and I know this sounds vague, but I'll say a little bit more about what this means. Um, and with these stats, we have two goals. Um, one is to create change. Um, around this broad ed educational issue, um, but specifically attending to structures and culture. So those gnomes. Um, and the second is to help people on the DAT become change agents through developing facilitation and leadership skills. So helping people get better at making change. Um, and so um, this ends up being roughly six to eight people. Um, and it's important that these span a diversity of roles um, and perspectives in the department. Um, and they, they meet um, around once every other week for 60 to 90 minutes. Um, and they've, they receive facilitated support for two to four semesters. Um, although many of our dads actually continue meeting after 
their time that after their facilitated time. Um, and actually, yeah, many of them also just become committees. Um, and um, so these external facilitators play this role um, where they are they're from outside of the department. Um, and they explicitly attend to the process and team development. So they're not coming in to push a certain agenda, but rather to help the group make sure that they're making progress toward the things they want to do. Um, and so toward that theme, um, the area of focus for the dots um, is basically just any broad scale issue, um, but the people in the room must decide for themselves by, by undergoing a process of developing a vision together. Um, so some of what this has looked like in the past um, might be things like cultivating inclusivity for underrepresented students, um, assessing disciplinary skills, improving undergraduate sense of belonging. Um, you can see these are these are actually quite different foci, um, but all of them are quite broad. Um, and sort of the last piece of um, really what the facilitators um, help them to do um, is, is think about the relationship to the department um in doing their work so um, cultivating chair support um, um, allies in the department um, and regularly gathering and implementing input um, from people outside the dot um, and so i actually won't talk a lot about how these dots run i'm happy to answer questions about them um, but i'll just mention uh, that um, we published a book on this which is really exciting um, it's many years of hard work here um, and in addition, we also have a free digital toolkit online, uh, which has like a lot of the activities um, and a sample of the book. Um, so even though we don't actually tell people in the dots what they should be working on, there are six core principles for the work that we do together. Um, and these core principles um, are design principles, I guess, if there are any kind of engineers in the room. Um, basically, the principles we try to uphold as we're as we're doing our work, um, and they're also what we think of as uh, ideal cultural characteristics for a department. Um, so these principles are one: students are partners in the educational process. That work focuses on achieving collective positive outcomes. So this really ties that shared vision that that's the thing you're working toward. Um, that data collection, analysis, and interpretation drive decision making. So not like panic data <laughs> um, or just gut feelings, but actually collecting the information you need. Um, that collaboration among group members is enjoyable, productive, and rewarding. So people must feel good about what they're doing. Um, that continuous improvement is an upheld process. So this refers to a change, especially change of this complexity. It's not just like a one and done. Thing, um, but it, it requires sort of constant monitoring um, to, to iterate toward your ultimate goal. Um, and finally, that work is grounded in a commitment to equity, inclusion, and social justice. Um, so we've written a, about the theory of these principles. Um, and uh, one of the things that we talk about is that all of these principles are actually quite interrelated. So I was gonna, I'm going to now talk about how these tie how all principles one through five tie to this commitment to equity. So um, if we're, so with students as partners in the educational process, um, specifically with respect to equity, this means it's important to include voices from students with, from marginalized backgrounds um, and to mitigate harm to those people. Um, for work focusing on achieving collective positive outcomes, um, this means in doing this shared vision, it's important to include the perspectives of people from marginalized groups. Um, I guess if you don't, it's not actually a shared vision for your community. Um, for data collection, analysis, and interpretation informing decision-making, um, it's also important to self-educate and mitigate your own biases um, when actually looking at data. Um, for collaboration among group members being enjoyable, productive, and rewarding, um, so in order to actually have your collaboration feel productive um, for everyone, um, it's important to set norms to guard against enacting features of oppressive cultures. Um, and then finally, um, for this continuous improvement is an upheld practice. Um, it's important to recognize that equity work is complex um, and it requires continuous learning, um, feedback and growth.
And so um, now I'm going to talk about some of the successes and challenges of student faculty partnerships. Um, and I know actually today I, I talked to many of the wonderful staff who work here, and I learned that staff are also playing a key role in, in the equity efforts um, here. And so um, I guess maybe as you're, as you're looking at this data, I guess maybe think about um, what role staff might play um, in some of these relationships as well. So students as partners, um, it basically is a, is a philosophy that it actually originated in some of the scholarship of teaching and learning space. Um, but so in, in higher education, it's, it's typical for faculty and staff to make decisions about education for students. Um, and students as partners um, is this philosophy that um, where you're really focusing on making decisions with students at the table. Um, and this has been enacted in all kinds of different ways. Like sometimes literally it means people at the same table, um, but other times it just means like finding ways to authentically involve student voice in decision making. And for us on the DAP project, um, we see four major components to what students as partners means. Um, so one is that is to recognize that students have unique and valued expertise. Um, Students know better than anyone what it is like to be a student right now, especially as the landscape of higher education is changing. You know, many of us faculty actually don't know that. But in addition, students aren't just experts in being students. You know, they have wonderful disciplinary expertise, um, leadership expertise. I guess here there's, there's also really prominent student activism that I think that we all can learn from. The second component is that the group seeks diverse student perspectives on an ongoing basis. This recognizes that students are not a monolith, um, but populations of students change over time. Um, so you can't just involve, you can't consult with students maybe at one point in the change process. Um, the third component is that students and faculty share power in decision making. Um, I think that this is one of the hardest ones to, to implement, um, uh, to actually have decision making um, be shared among students and faculty. Um, and then I guess the final component is that students see themselves as partners. So it's not enough for, for the faculty um, or the staff to say, oh, students are partners here because they're members. Um, if the students themselves don't actually see themselves as partners, that's usually a good clue that there's something about the partnership um, that, isn't, that isn't going right. Um, and so why should we care about students as partners? Um, I guess maybe I just argued that, that students um, have all of this expertise. Um, and they're, they're well suited to understand how a change effort will affect students. Um, and then also research has documented uh, that students as partners has all kinds of other interesting positive outcomes, like sense of belonging, motivation, confidence, even content learning, um, which maybe seems a little bit unexpected. Um, and I guess also plenty of affordances um, for faculty as well. Um, but even kind of with these great aspects of students as partners, um, it's not easy. Uh, institutional structures, kind of the, the, the way that, um, that our departments are organized, um, have historically excluded students from the decision-making process. Um, and it also requires hard work to do ethically and thoughtfully, so sort of not in a way that's tokenizing or extractive. Um, and just generally, this is different from kind of the typical culture um, where faculty are deciders. So um, the structures are, are both creating challenges and the sort of what's normal here, um, this is also quite different from. Um, and so how we do this on the DAP project um, is have student members um, when possible. So DAP facilitators encourage the DAPs to have facilitators. Um, students are paid for their time. So um, in the DAP project, we use grant funding to pay for students to be there. Um, and in some cases, um, not all DAPs, we felt were ready to have students in the room right away. Um, that we facilitated discussions with faculty and staff before the students got there. Um, and then sort of once they're there, it also requires additional work. Um, so 
um, facilitators um, would do things kind of in during meetings like revoicing and affirming student ideas, just monitoring and making sure that um, students are participating. Um, and also outside of meetings, checking in um, with students and non-students um, to see if there were ways that those interactions could be improved. And so um, I guess I want to unpack a little bit of how we're thinking about partnership. Um, so while most students as partners literature has really focused on the positive features of SAP, um, and actually like, like almost all of the literature, um, what we noticed is that how people define partnership um, was often using, we thought of it like surface level indicators. So looking at um, you know, who was talking and for how long, or who's voting. Um, but we thought that that probably doesn't share, doesn't describe the full picture. Um, so we advocate for moving beyond just the question of, are students partners on the stat um, toward asking in what ways are they partners and in what ways are they not? Um, and so just a little, like really quickly through how this analysis works, um, so I know that most people are not education researchers. Um, so because this work was actually quite exploratory, um, we, we did, uh, this was a qualitative study, um, collecting pre and post interviews with that members, um, looking at segments um, in the transcripts that discuss partnership, um, and then going through this process of identifying themes across transcripts, um, or thematic coding. Um, and then we use that to construct case studies of, of um, different DAPs that we work with. And so without getting into all of the nuts and bolts um, of the research itself, um, I just wanna uh, now describe two of the themes that came out um, in our study. Um, the first theme was a tension between student agency and imbalanced work. Um, and here's a quote from a student, Ellen, uh, who was on a DAT that we call herbs, um, because we can't actually say what, what the names of these departments are. Um, so this is Ellen on herbs. Um, she says, sometimes faculty sit back and they're like, well, I don't know, what do you wanna do? What do you wanna do? What do you wanna do? You sort of make the students make all the decisions implicitly that way. It doesn't feel very productive, it feels, kind of masked, like, look how empowered you are. But instead it's like, look how much work you can do instead of me, which isn't the best. And so um, this quote from Ellen reveals how um, leaving, these leaving the decision-making and sort of pushing the decision-making upon students um, might look like empowerment. Um, and even actually as a facilitator of this stat, I would have thought, or I guess I would have said um, that this was a dat that did students as partners well. Um, but after um, spending time with this interview from Ellen, um, I realized um, that what might look like empowerment can actually feel like unbalanced work on, um, in the experiences of students. And so if we're simply just looking for, do students contribute to decisions here? Um, it doesn't actually talk about um, or get at um, who is making decisions about the process um, and how the process gets done. Um, the other theme I'm going to bring up here um, is a sense of intimidation. And this was particularly present among the undergrads in our study. Um, so here's a student, Sawyer, from a department summoning, who says, I think the first two times I was super hesitant to speak up. All these people that are from the department, and here's me, this undergrad student. I didn't feel like my opinion mattered, just personally, because I was just intimidated, essentially. Everyone had PhDs, and I don't. That was obviously a personal thing. But after warming up, getting to know everyone, I think it became very like, we're all equal and we can share ideas. And so I think this quote from Sawyer is really interesting. He talks about how eventually he got to this place that, that we wanted. Like, like we want Sawyer to feel like um, he's able to share his ideas and not feel intimidated. But this initial sense of intimidation um, was really common amongst the students and then we sort of see them, we see them um, like basically locating this problem as within themselves. Like he says, like I was intimidated, but that was my fault. Um, and so as a facilitator, um, as one of the people who organizes how people interact in this space, um, I think it's not enough to just take what Sawyer says at face value and say, oh yeah, that was his fault. 
um, but rather there are, there are likely things within the space that might have queued up um, certain roles and hierarchies um, uh, that, that maybe we could mitigate as facilitators and sort of mitigate um, the hierarchies that show up in that space. Um, and so to summarize kind of how we think about partnership and how that's evolved over time. Um, so going back to one of our first components of students as partners, that students have unique and valued expertise. Initially, we, might, we thought that that might look like faculty eliciting or validating students' expertise or students taking on work. Um, but we also now um, are attentive to like how the, the sort of division of labor and making sure that students aren't taking too much work and that students aren't responsible for all of the expertise. Um, the, second, um, uh, the second component of students as partners is that students and faculty share power and decision-making. Um, initially, we thought that we might see that as, it, that might look like students voting or voicing opinions. Um, but now we're also attentive to whether or not students are contributing to decisions about process. Um, so do students get to contribute to deciding who decides um, or is all of that process decided um, sort of among, among faculty? Um, and this last component is that students see themselves as partners. Um, initially, we, might, we thought that that might look like students talking about themselves as DAP members, kind of like the second half of that quote from Sawyer. Um, but now we also want to think about how institutional roles um, um, show up in that space and just work to, to minimize um, the sort of presence uh, of that, that sort of subtle hierarchy in the space. Um, and so just to reflect um, a bit more on students as partners, um, so, it's important to recognize the experience and expertise that student leaders bring, um, value them for, for their ideas, and actually compensate them for their efforts. So don't just pay them in pizza. Um, uh, and I also wanna point out that in this work that we did, um, we were really trying to be self-critical about the ways that we were um, creating or closing off opportunities um, for students to be partners, because ultimately that's how our project will improve and do this better. Um, because I wanna point out that in some ways, um, we reproduced the hierarchies that we were intending to disrupt by having students on that in the first place. And so I hope that by sharing this data with you all, um, and especially since you all have student members on committees, um, just to, to might be an opportunity to reflect um, on our interactions in these student faculty partnerships um, and how we might be unintentionally reproducing these dynamics. Um, and I just wanna also add that um, because student populations tend to be more diverse than faculty, um, th it is also important to think about how those hierarchies are also intersecting with other forms of marginalization that people in the room might be experiencing. Um, and so I also just want to do a shout out um, because in uh, one, one place where students are being leaders here, um, I just wanted to point out the Access Network um, and Compass, which was so formative for me. Um, and one place where I, where I am actually really lucky to, to still interact with many students from Berkeley. Um, and so just to summarize, Change is complex. Um, and so we should anticipate which gnomes might show up as we're trying to enact some change. And in, importantly, inequities are cultural issues. And so if we just try to, to address inequity with individual focused solutions, it will not be sufficient. Um, that change is possible. Um, we should think about the principles that underlie what we're doing. Um, and, and try to uphold those as we're doing the work. Um, and finally, that change is a process. So um, finding ways to critically reflect on our progress, um, such as what, what I just showed you with students as partners, um, is ultimately how we grow. And it's exactly five o'clock. Um, so I wanna thank you all for being a lovely audience um, and also all of the DAP participants. Um, I invite folks to reach out to me if you wanna talk more about departmental change. 
um, if you're interested in getting involved in phys physics education research, um, or if there's any students in the room who are interested in teaching at an undergraduate focused minority serving institution. All right, thank you folks. Yeah, question. Yeah, of course. So um, I love this question. Uh, this question is, uh, so <laughs> in this project, I just showed research that, and now I'm adding my own, um, research that happened <laughs> by several postdocs, actually, um, to, to develop these case studies um, that, take, that takes, it's very resource intensive, right, to actually do a comprehensive view where you're, you're interviewing everyone on a DAT. Um, and so how, what could we do um, where we don't have access to that kind of resource, where the NSF isn't paying us to learn more about this. Um, yeah, I, I love this question. I don't actually think I have an easy answer for you, unfortunately, but um, I just want to say that it's really important to be thinking about this because um, ultimately sort of finding these ways to, to give and receive feedback um, is crucial. I think so maybe one, one thing that kind of needs to be at the foundation is that the, I'd say the group needs to have a commitment to feedback. Um, and I don't think that that, I don't think that that is like the norm <laughs> in most groups that, that we, um, that sort of feedback is accepted and sought out and received. Um, and so I think maybe just getting on the same page about, um, you know, what feedback is and how we want to give it to each other, um, I think that that can be um, a really important step, right? Because, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think those are great ideas, and I think it also kind of comes, comes back to the, is there a culture of having feedback? Because you don't want to create like an anonymous Google form or even, or even like a question back to the department um, if it's not clear you know, what recipients are going to do with that information. Um, and like, I, I guess I would, I would be worried that a feedback form on its own won't be enough if you don't have sort of a commitment um, to giving feedback. Um, one thing that actually did work well on the DAP project um, that was, is much shorter than an interview um, is something similar to what you described. Um, so uh, with a few of the DATs, we would just do kind of like, like an exit ticket like you might do at the end of a class, um, which is some really, uh, with, with some like specific prompts, um, you know, a, that are getting at sort of power and, um, you know, whether you feel like you're a part of the group, um, and then the facilitators can kind of take that in. Um, in the times I did it, we actually, we didn't give like the raw data back to people, um, but rather we, we did a little bit of work to, to read through it, um, to synthesize um, and to suggest some areas for, for growth. Um, so it, it might be that an external person might be good for that. Um, and in times in my life where I've had hard conversations, an external person can be really great for that. Um, but again, it really comes back to the do people, have people agreed on <laughs> like that feedback is a good thing and, and what they should do with that? Yeah.
Right. Yeah. Um, so I guess the question was, is anim anonymity important? Um, actually, that wasn't the person's name. That was a pseudonym we gave to that person. Um, and, and we actually didn't show the, the actual department's name because, you know, people in the room might literally know people in various departments. Um, and so, you know, I think anonymity can be really valuable because because you also don't want people to associate the feedback like, I think that sometimes it, it can help to have some distance um, in order to actually hear the feedback um, and, and to think about what is what the person is sharing um, when it's so localized in a person. Um, there's also, I mean, other things to worry about in a department when you have students giving feedback to faculty. Like students and faculty have all kinds of relationships outside of the DAT space. Like someone might literally be assigning grades to someone. Um, and so I think just taking care um, to not actually name people can, can be productive for multiple reasons. Yeah. Okay, I see, oh my gosh. Um, let's, let's go here. Yeah. Hmm. What a great question. So the question was, um, like a common gnome we might see is that students are, are sort of transient. Um, and so, and because they're not here for a very long time. So maybe why, why, should, we, why should we care what their experiences are? Um, yeah, I appreciate you asking this, Hannah. And I don't know if I have like a really immediate like response actually to how we might reframe it. I mean, I think it is true. Like, I think, I think that, or in some sense, well, so it is true that students are often not here for very long. Um, and it actually creates additional challenges like doing this work because you, because while a faculty might, member might be able to work on something for five years, um, a student probably can't unless they're a grad student. Um, and so um, that actually limits some of the ways that they can, like a single person can be involved. Um, and I think that's also why a lot of equity efforts also struggle with continuity, particularly when they're student-led. Um, yeah, and so maybe the thing we should be asking is maybe because of the short time that students are often at a university, like how do we want to work to have the vision? Well, I guess maybe the vision, how do, how, how do we work to have the vision be able to be adaptable kind of as more people are joining? Um, and also to have enough continuity to keep the work and momentum going. Um, I feel like I'm not really answering your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, maybe we can talk more about this at dinner. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's go. Let's go here. Yeah. Hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great question. Um, so the question was often, um, or maybe particularly here, sometimes it can feel like um, faculty and students have the sort of us versus them perspective, where maybe we don't feel like we're working together, but maybe we're, we often feel, we feel more like we're pushing against each other than working together. Um, I don't think that that is <laughs> unique um, to Berkeley at all like I think that like I don't I don't actually think the University of Colorado is that different from uh, from Berkeley um, and I definitely saw a lot of that in my time there um, and we do try to do a different thing in the DAP model right by bringing people in the room um, and it's hard work um, because a lot of times people don't have a good sense for what it means to be in the other role um, and I think like like a, diff, a different common thing that we saw and um, that I didn't show in the interviews is students saying things like, I always wondered why faculty can't just do X. And then I realized, or I learned through being in this stat, kind of what all of the institutional obstacles to doing X would be. 
Um, and so like even the DAO itself created mechanisms for transparency that students um, might not have even been aware of. Um, and I also think that um, for faculty, they learned, they, they were able to have more in-depth conversations with students about their experiences um, than maybe just like, you know, sort of one-off bits of feedback where sometimes it can be hard to know what to do with when someone um, raises an issue to you, um, whereas actually sustained conversation about it um, can often reveal something that you should be doing together. Um, yeah, and I think this is also where facilitators played a huge role um, in, in helping make sure that the people in the room are heard um, rather than you know, maybe say like, kind of quickly reacting to each other um, without like maybe more active listening. Yeah, but it's 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 definitely hard work. Yeah. Okay, I was maybe just gonna go this way if that's all right. Okay. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so this is a question of, of like maybe some particular obstacles to, to doing this work might be, um, so I guess you named two of them. So one is, I think the first one that you named was that students um, might actually just be busy or maybe not the right, not the right representative. Um, and then the second was that maybe students don't, there are things that they don't know about their learning. Um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think all of the, these things are risks, right? Um, uh, I guess I can say a little bit about the recruitment process. So we do encourage departments to not go with, say, the usual suspects of students. Um, so it's important that it's not the student who's on kind of all the things and who's maybe the, the, the one that the department sort of holds up as some leader Right, but that you, you you want to make sure that that every student kind of knows that, to, that they could apply it, or in some cases maybe you might have an application process, um, but you you do want to seek out um, someone who's more like a typical student. Um, I think in, I mean, I feel like the same danger of maybe them not being representative, like also it goes for the faculty and staff in the room too, um, and so. I actually think this is something that we need to think about for everyone on the DAT is, um, and, and maybe this ties back to the, our principle three around data collection analysis and decision making, that sort of like N equals me has limitations um, if that's the thing that you're using to, to talk about decisions. So um, we also push them to also gather kind of broader input in that way. Um, yeah, and I think actually like the thing, I have never experienced a DAT where students say, we should just make this discipline easier, um, right? But I think, like, we've had pretty good experiences with students on the DAT. I think, yeah, actually, like, and I think this comes down to the, the visioning process, too, of, of how it starts. Um, that, that usually there's something in the room, that everyone in the room can agree that is important to work on, um, right? And that, that is the thing that becomes the vision, yeah.
Yeah, that's a great question. So is it, do DATs exist outside of committees or should committees try to take on that structure? Um, yes. <laughs> well, I guess it looks different in every department. Like, because every department actually has kind of separate needs. Um, in the departments that we worked with, um, we specifically tried to have the DATs be like a separate type of thing. Um, they did have some similarities to commitment committees. So usually, um, like a department chair was willing to have the DAT be part of someone's service load, right? So that they maybe could step off of a different committee to do this thing. Um, and, you know, in some departments that might give normal committee report outs, like a DAT might also report out in the same way. Um, and so I think, yeah, in some ways, um, committees were like departments, but but being outside of the committee structure also opened up a lot of possibilities for us. So um, like most departments we worked with to not have students on committees um, uh, or some, or and, or staff on committees or sometimes like staff might be like a non-voting member, right? And so um, it kind of freed us up to not be a committee to do things differently. Um, um, but with that said, like kind of a common like end point for DATs after facilitation ended um, was that they just formalized themselves as committees so they could keep kind of maintaining, say things like, you know, faculty service credit and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, some DATs became committees. Um, and probably an area for future study is we also heard informally that some committees also took on some DAT-like features in the department. Um, so maybe things that were working well in the DAT were also starting to get adopted in other places. Um, so all of the above. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. So who were facilitators here? Um, so they definitely had to be outside of the department. That's part of the design is actually that these are people who, um, who can ask questions about things that might seem obvious to the people in the room, um, who might be able to challenge others in a way that people might not be free to challenge people in their own department. Um, uh, and um, I guess they, so some facilitators were researchers and some facilitators were just facilitators, um, like 100% facilitators. Um, and uh, I guess facilitators had a certain set of training. So um, they, I guess a lot of them came from science ed backgrounds. So they had some knowledge already of STEM teaching and learning. Um, we also uh, did a lot of reading together about like the organizational change literature. Um, which um, comes a lot from like kind of business management side, which has some applicability to what we do here. Um, and also just the institutional change literature in higher ed. Um, yeah, so I think the skill set of the facilitator is also pretty important too, um, to kind of help the group actually move along and make progress, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think the, the facilitators, I fully agree with you, facilitators are a key part of this. And it's, it's honestly hard for me to imagine how you might adapt pieces of this, um, specifically when it comes to facilitators. Um, but one thing that, so Joel Corbo, um, who uh, was, was one of the PIs on this project, um, he's working on these uh, Department Action Leadership Institute, Dolly, I think if you look this up, um, through APS. So, um, he's leading these groups of faculty and um, within uh, like maybe the organizational home of APS um, to help them develop some facilitation skills so that they could go off and do this. Um, and I think it's just an active area of research to see how well that will work. Um, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, great, great question. Like what are some of the changes that we actually did here? Um, so uh, let's see, an example of one change was um, around trying to 
So the issue that they were focusing on was sort of lack of alignment in the majors courses, um, which is something that actually a lot of departments can struggle with that, you know, like what gets taught in which majors course, you know, how do you sequence it, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and, and you can imagine how that alone couldn't be fixed by just like a one off thing if someone comes in and says these people teach this these people teach this like that's super not sustainable. Um, so what the DAT ended up doing was they got the, de the department to agree to create um, basically these coordinator roles um, that were uh, sort of like one the equivalent of a course release um, for four people who, who ended up whose role it is, is to actually keep that aligned. Um, and so, so that, that structure continues to exist in this department. Um, and this happened maybe five years ago. Um, so we actually wrote a paper on the sustainability of this because it's, it's the, the, the sustainability of any of these changes is really important to understand. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, another example would be like we had a department or a DAT um, that was really focused on um, sort of representation, recruitment, and retention of students from marginalized backgrounds. Um, and they ended up, um, they, they had created um, some events in the department where people, uh, basically like a series of workshops um, for folks. Um, and they had also done some work um, in the admissions committee in that department. Um, and then sort of ultimately their, their sort of ending was just to become uh, a formal committee in the department that sort of continues to run these things. Um, and that's that's just some people's service load in that department. Yeah, and so they actually, yeah, they got an award just this year um, in the at the, at the, at the university level for the work that they've been doing. Um, yeah, other changes, I guess skills assessment was another debt that I worked with. Um, that was trying to understand whether or not students graduating from this department had actually learned the skills of the discipline. Um, and so they ended up developing um, sort of two tools that they're still using. One is actually they developed, a, they developed an assessment themselves that they just give to students. Um, so, so they're sort of tracking progress over time. Another thing that they developed is um, like this automated thing that you feed in, you feed in syllabi <laughs> every year, um, and it sort of tells you which of the department skills um, are, are being covered that year. Um, and they also institutionalize a role for somebody, so somebody has the equivalent of a course release to do this. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Oh, of course. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I feel like actually I can show you a little bit about our theory of change. Maybe this is actually, this might be a little, this might be a lot. Um, so don't actually look at all of the words. I grayed out a lot of the words so that you can't actually read all of them. Um, but a key part of the dot doing its work um, is, is cultivating a relationship with the department. Um, so the thing I'm showing is actually a diagram of how we think the thing that we do leads to the outcomes that I talked about. Um, and so building a relationship with a department um, is, is a key part of the process. It's actually, it's like, it's just as important as designing the project itself. Um, and, and those two things need to feed into each other. So, um, like I actually try to avoid the term buy-in when I'm talking about departmental change because I think that, that what we're, we're talking about is something more than buy-in, which is actually like really gaining input and, and sort of cultivating allies and being able to implement, um, to actually implement the things that other people in the department care about. Um, and so um, it's part of the model that, that we, that facilitators are, um, are ensuring that the data is, is actually interfacing with other people in the department. Um, we also, a thing we, I didn't really talk about, um, but is, is actually in our book that John has, um, is that we, we help people learn things about how change happens. Um, so even just like 
like theory about institutional change um, so that they can take that into conversations with other people. Um, so for example, you know, like there's all these reasons why people might resist change, right? Um, and if you, go, if you learn the theory of why someone might resist change, um, that'll definitely help you have a better conversation um, or help you in a faculty meeting or something. Um, yeah, so you're absolutely right that the department needs to be a key part of it, especially if it's going to end up devoting resources over the long term <laughs> to, to the sustainability of something. Yeah. Other questions? I don't I don't even know what time it is. <laughs> oh, so we're like really over. Okay. Um well, I wonder if we should maybe like formally end then so that people can have a socially acceptable time to leave if they would like to do so. Um, yeah, so thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm happy to hang out here for a couple more minutes if folks have other questions. Um, yeah, but it was lovely to, to see you all. Great, thanks folks. Also, sorry to everyone in the chat that I walked away and didn't see your questions. <laughs>